<clears throat> Can everyone hear me? Okay, good morning. Um, I'm Holly Reed. I'm professor of sociology at uh, Queens College here at the City of University of New York. And I'm the editor of International Migration Review. And I am uh, really pleased to be joining you this morning. And we're going to try to um, build upon some of what uh, Professor Alenikoff uh, talked about by really giving you um, a, stage, a stage setting for talking about forcibly displaced populations of all kinds. Um, and we are going to be joined by uh, several of our distinguished panelists. Two of them are here with us and two online. And um, I'll just briefly introduce them. You can read more about their biographies in your packet. Um, Ellen Percy Crayley uh, is a professor emerita of geography and environmental studies at Colgate University. And she's going to introduce us to uh, sort of a global demographic profile of forced migrants um, writ large. Um, Lori Hunter, who um, asked a question in the first panel, she's uh, online. And she is a professor of sociology and director of the Institute of Behavioral Science at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And she's going to talk about her own research on the relationship between environmental change and livelihood migration. Um, Beth Elizabeth Ferris um, is research professor and director of the Institute for the Study of Migration at Georgetown University. And uh, Beth is going to focus on commonalities across different forced migra migrant populations, including climate migration. And then we are also pleased to be joined online by um, Professor Veronica Finn Bruy, who is assistant professor at Athabasca University in Canada. And she is also um, president of the International Association for the Study of Forced Migration. Um, and she's going to highlight the challenges faced by forced migrants based on her own perspective and personal narrative as a refugee and survivor of war and as the president of IASFM. So um, without further ado, I will turn to Ellen. Each, each speaker will speak for about 12 minutes, um, and uh, then we will have time for questions from the audience and discussion. Ninth one? Ninth. Okay. Not the ninth, but I think it's the ninth, ninth symposium. Um, Alex, what a fantastic presentation. I found my colleague from Villanova. You always learn something and start thinking about things in new ways. I think you've added a word to Mario's um, uh, reminder that we're talking about love. We're also talking about home. And I think that's a, a, a value, a principle, a perspective that we should keep close to our hearts, even in demographic research, which I won't talk about. I hope to uh, circle back to some of the issues that you have raised and to anticipate issues that uh, my colleague Lori Hunter will be talking about. Did I just turn this off? I just turned it on. Can we turn it back on? Justin, I already made a mistake. I will ask that. I think it's on. There, there we you go. go. Let's go back. <laughs> Um, it's a privilege to be here. Uh, Holly Reed, Lori Hunter, Elizabeth Ferris, Veronica, Finn Bruy. I've learned from all of you in your writing, so it's a privilege to be among you. Um, I'd like to very briefly provide some description of levels, trends, patterns of refugee and forced migration at different scales of analysis, as well as think, have us think about some tools for comparative analysis that advances description towards explanation of patterns of difference among populations and migrant groups. Uh, I'd first like to begin with some context uh, in terms of perspectives, demographic perspectives on refugee and forced migration. I've got uh, three names there in brackets, Kifitz, Cole, Keeley. These are folks that uh, looked at formal demography or didn't look at formal demography in relationship to migration uh, patterns. Um, demographers like things that are predictable, often based in kind of the human condition and biology, like fertility and mortality. Migration isn't like that. It's uh, much more, well, we might think stochastic. Our colleague Gary Zolberg always thought it was structured. 
uh, which is something we need to think about. Um, so if we look at the work of Kefitz, who looked at emigration and uh, population growth, Ainsley Cole, Office of Population Research at Princeton, he actually solved, analytically solved, the problem of the relationship or the, the, the project of the relationship between migration and stable population growth. He didn't think it was interesting and he didn't publish it. It was Charlie Keeley who got right in there and pulled that information out to work on the relationship with, with immigration and emigration using the work of Bob Warren to think about the relationship between U.S. immigration and uh, future population growth. But we had to dig and pull and push and use our, our, our arms and our voices to say this is relevant. Immigration is relevant from a demographic point of view. Um, uh, and then there's Holly Booth. Holly is with the Commission on Population at National Academy of San, uh, Sciences with her colleagues, Ron uh, Waldman, and, uh, and again, Charlie Keeley, really drew attention to demographic perspectives on, um, on forced and refugee migration. And now we've ordained it to MOMA. International Union for the Scientific Study of Population uh, created a scientific panel under mentorship of Graham Hugo, whom we lost, as we have Charlie, um, and uh, Mohammed Jalal Abazi Shabazi, uh, and this has uh, uh, moved forward to more attention by the National Academy of Sciences, and as you'll see, the Journal of Migration and Human Security special issue on the role of demographic research in migrant integration. So we're gaining momentum, and I'll end with a little more momentum really excellent work out there. The trends um, speak for themselves, increasing trends. Um, the mid-year estimates for 2023 just upped us another 2 million to 110 million persons forcibly displaced. Um, but as Veronica will uh, reminds us um, and will remind us how quickly these trends and patterns change, um, we Perhaps should be talking about the geography of forced migration as much as the demography. Give you this. People online are having trouble hearing, hearing me. Yeah. That might be okay. <laughs> um, it to be in, right in front of me. Right in front of me, okay. Um, so we might be thinking also very closely about changing geographies and the ever emerging geographies of forced migration. After October 7th, we're certainly thinking about those issues. In describing these trends and patterns, I rely on uh, the compendia from the UN um, High Commissioner for Refugees, the reports, um, the published data, and the visualizations that are provided annually and, and also within the year. Um, I haven't been completely um, uh, lazy in relying on these patterns and, and visualizations, however, uh, because there are now searchable uh, documents that we can get into to really pull out data on both the stock population of, of, of migrants that are uh, forcibly displaced, um, as well as flows. There's increasing attention to the flow, the annual kind of the relentless rhythms of displacement over time. So a lot of good resources out and available. Um, and so we can look at the geographies in terms of the regional dimensions uh, of forced migration, and the geography of countries of asylum, and to a very large extent, uh, uh, the proximity to countries of origin of forced migrants and refugees. Um, so these data are, that are available in great detail are increasingly searchable with the refugee data uh, finder as well as the flow data set that is available from uh, UN uh, UNHCR resources. Um, the data on flows are increasingly exciting to look at, and they are being coupled with efforts to predict through now casting. And now we're beginning to move from description to trying to think about modeling and analysis and uh, providing tools that can support 
both mitigation response and hopefully protection. Now in, um, I didn't mean to do that kind of animation. <laughs> Jeez. Um, I actually, there, I had one, ex I had to get back into Excel, as you will see, and I was so rusty at it. I had one Excel age pyramid that was so cranky, PowerPoint spit it out. It wouldn't let me even show it. So uh, we'll get to some simpler diagrams in a second. But embedded in the compendia for the global trends is a little bit of analysis. If you look carefully at this age pyramid, there's a comparison between the age and gender structure of forced migrants to the world population. That's a comparison. That's saying there's a difference here and we have to pay attention to that difference and that difference should mean something. And this leads uh, me to the, have us think about comparisons. We can draw from the toolkit of demography to think about migration selectivity. That is, migrants draw from a population at risk, a source population, they may look the sim same, or more likely they're going to look different by some characteristics, age or gender, education perhaps, race perhaps. We can think about migration differentials. That's a different kind of a comparison to some other selected population, a reference group. And this is, uh, you know, the, at the core of the social science of migrant integration, to whom are we comparing our migrants? Um, and that's a very important choice. And it's always related to the denominators. Who are we comparing the migrant characteristics to? It's a political choice, it's, it's a theoretical choice, it's a scientific choice, but should, in my view, be guided by research and policy questions that are clearly, clearly specified. So I wanted to illustrate some of these tools with selected forcibly migra migrant groups. So here we have Ethiopians uh, in these broad age groups that are organized by UNHCR in the searchable uh, data finder. These wouldn't be the age groups I might pick, but, uh, but there they exist. And here I've related um, the uh, characteristics of the Ethiopian displaced population to the Ethiopian population. Those data come from UNDESA, the Population Division and the Statistical Division at the United Nations uh, um, Department of Economic and Social Affairs. So, um, so I'm combining two data sets here with the numerator uh, and, and, and different comparison groups. And it gives us a picture of of Ethiopian displaced person populations relative to the Ethiopian population at the same mid-year 2021. Now, if you go back to that, if you think about that other um, uh, age pyramid in the, in the red circle, it should emphasize the point there was forcibly migration, uh, migrant population was younger. It isn't compared to the Ethiopian population. You draw, you get a different picture, you tell a different story. I'm not telling that story right now, but that what I'm, we're trying to draw attention to is um, uh, that, that there is, that different comparisons lead you to think about things in a different way. The research question, the policy question has to be clearly specified. Uh, then we can think about this in relationship to the countries of asylum and how our populations look relative to where the Ethiopians go. And here I've got Canada, um, uh, I can't see the other countries, uh, Kenya and Uganda. And they're very different profiles in terms of the Ethiopians relative to the Ugandan population, relative to the uh, Kenyan population. Okay, good, I'm there. Same thing, uh, we, a, a similar pattern for the Afghani population that's been displaced. And then I start comparing it to within countries of asylum. I look at the Afghanis in, in Iran, uh, makes me kind of wonder about that age profile. It says to me, got to look at the data. Have the data been changed? Or they, do they include first and second and third generation as one might expect with Afghanis in Iran? Uh, but it raises questions and takes me to a, a, some new 
Same thing with Venezuelans. Now, we're not labeled as the Venezuelan population in the data, but other international persons of, of concern to the UN in need of, of protection. And here, uh, looking at Venezuelans in, in Canada, in Colombia, and in Germany, again, a very different uh, perspective. And if we, in fact, looked at the Venezuelans relative to the German population, they would look younger. Uh, but they don't look that much different from the, uh, they don't look younger than certainly the, the Venezuelan population uh, in place. Uh, and then comparing these to the country of a selected country of asylum, Canada, uh, we get differentials. And we could do this analysis for education, for race, for uh, uh, other health. I think health would be very interesting to look at in this day and age. Um, again, different stories told depending on points of comparison. Um, and of course, this takes us to the quality of the data, the nature of the data, the degree to which Canada, Germany, Kenya are defining populations in the same way. And we do have good work done by the expert group on uh, refugee IDP and statelessness statistics that are putting in place uh, recommendations about how to have comparable data at the international and regional level and also comparable indicators. Wouldn't it be nice if we could collapse age in different ways to answer different questions? Wouldn't it be effective if we could look at dimensions of, dare I say it, human capital and education uh, and training? vis-a-vis -vis different population groups. Good work there that really is paying attention to both implementation and the importance of denominators. We need census data. We need national estimates of non-migrants as well as migrants. Uh, so we come back, we look at this good work. There's more good work, a new scientific panel from IUSSP focusing on global conflict and climate change in relationship population change under the uh, chairmanship of Raya Mutarik, we know well, superb demographer, taking us to issues of the interconnections between climate change and displacement, conflict and displacement, and the interactions between climate change and conflict as well. So really closing those analytic gaps. Always to draw comparisons, and I underline the variation, the attention to variation by population subgroups uh, that will help us understand drivers. Linda Laurie's point, the changing drivers of population trends, trends, trends and displacement, um, helping us big build theory, helping us predict structural dimensions of displacement, as Aries Ulrich would certainly want us to do. So we come to the end, I come to conclude here. This is a big number, the mid-year estimate of 110 million forcibly displaced relative to the world's population is big at an absolute level as well as a relative level, 1.4 or almost 1.5% of the world's population displaced. But that varies, it varies by groups and by region and by nation quarter of Ukrainians, perhaps one out of six Afghanis, perhaps a fifth of Syrians displaced from their homes, from their homes. And then for some populations, as I think Veronica may take us, is to the conceptual and humane challenge uh, in, that exists in specifying the very population, the very state, the very community of origins for some peoples in the world. Lynn, I thank you for letting me try to try to think through how demography might rise to meet at least some of these challenges. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Ellen. I think uh, this is really important, especially the point about how we need to push forward on uh, understanding better climate migrants um, and, and enumerating them and comparing them. Um, so, and with that point, I'm going to turn to Lori Hunter, who's joining us from online.
How does that look, the screen? You can see the PowerPoint, not every, okay. All right, thank you so much. Um, fantastic, thank you, Holly, and thank you, Veronica. So, um, boy, am I happy to be here. Um, I wish I were there, but of course I didn't contribute to a mission, so I'm not actually quite proud of that, <laughs> although I am missing uh, in-person conversation, but I really appreciated the humanity and the compassion with which this was open. So uh, thank you for that. I so appreciate the focus on climate-related migration by the keynote uh, speaker and this idea of a global platform protecting individuals and households from displacement. I think that's uh, it's it's wonderful to think about. And thank you, Ellen, for laying a groundwork in terms of measurement. I think the the connection between climate and migration is especially challenging to measure um, for all sorts of reasons that I'm happy to talk about when we get to the Q&A. But we hear that word climate migration a lot. And I just wanna unpack that a little bit here and think about when does livelihood migration become forced? So my own work looks at the ways in which climate related pressures um, influence the likelihood of a household moving or um, a household sending an individual to imagine a big city, right? To send back remittances. So that kind of livelihood migration. So at one point does climate, do climate pressures um, intensify to the point that we might consider that forced migration? So that's one of the questions I wanna grapple with. Um, and I will do this. I'll give an overview of migration climate research. I really like thinking about the motivation um, for this really amazing body of work that has uh, accumulated over the past two decades, because I think it relates to some of the dialogue we hear today. I'll talk about findings, not just my own, but the body of work, and then think about remaining puzzles and promising approaches. And this is all related to that idea of livelihood migration relative to forced migration and as associated with climate. So first, back in 2005, and it was the early 2000s, um, mid 2000s, where there was this alarmist rhetoric around climate refugees. So even the UN in 2005 put out some forecasts as related to climate refugees. There was a, a scary alarmist documentary in 2010 called Climate Refugees. But you know, even six years later, the United Nations pulled back from their forecast after these really dramatic sort of refugee movements did not take place. Today, in 2020, I think there's a whole pushback on this idea of climate refugees for some of the reasons, right, that were talked about in the, by our keynote speaker. But now we're seeing things like, oh, oh, now we're seeing things like, this is from 2020, predictions of mass migration um, are from climate change are rife, but not necessarily accurate. Climate migration research is very different from the alarmist sort of rhetoric. And you know that you've made it as a research community when the Rolling Stone covers your work. But are we thinking about climate migration all wrong? Apocalyptic predictions might grab our attention, but they can also stoke xenophobia and miss the full picture of what's happening on the ground. So I think that this sort of pushback around the simplistic climate refugees was really the product of um, you know, this emergence of this scholarship, which I'll, I'll talk briefly about in a moment. But in 2011, sort of, um, this framework was put forward, and it's over a decade old now, but I want to highlight it because it's the first one that really, migration sort of framework that really explicitly integrated the environment. For, so for those of us that were working in this space, it was really exciting and has been really useful. So we all know as a, as a research community, right, there are personal household characteristics that influence the migration decision on the right hand side. There are meso level factors like political frameworks. There are all sorts of different macro factors, um, conflict, insecurity, uh, demographic um, population structure influences, say, the labor force, for example. Economic pressures as well influence migration. But this framework explicitly thought about the environment as a direct factor influencing the decision. So think about right the uh, extreme events displacing households, um, or the environment can also act as an indirect driver, the big blue arrow there, by influencing some of the other, other drivers. So imagine, you know, chronic drought 
um, our chronic heat, heat waves influence the different kinds of employment opportunities available, which then influence migration decision making. So thinking carefully about how the environment interacts with other drivers um, was a real contribution of this framework. And of course, when we think about forced migration, we th think about it in terms of agency, right? So there's high agency movement, maybe lifestyle migration or migrants uh, pursuing different kinds of amenities, maybe mid-level at migrants pursuing economic opportunities because they're too few and far between in their community of origin, and then low agency um, movement, which is what we might consider forced. And we know that typhoons, for example, force displacement, right? But the question that I, I was asking to our keynote speaker is, so imagine a, a drought, a chronic drought. At what point, either in a temporal on a temporal scale, so at one point does that drought become the primary factor that's pushing a household, um, a, a forcing factor? So it's temporal and it's also the scale of severity, right? So it's just not as clear as it might be in, in terms of a typhoon. So that's the kind of thing I wanna think about today. So let me briefly go through some findings from the migration climate literature. So I mentioned that a whole bunch of work, including my own emerged over the past couple of decades. And there was a meta-analysis two years ago, this was published 2020, and there's a whole bunch of reviews that have come forward in the past two years. If anybody's interested, I can provide all sorts of references for those. But what these folks did was they, they gathered together lots of studies from different regions across the world, and they did a meta-analysis. So they standardized um, the measures of environmental effects to really think about what does this body of work tell us? So, and of course, many of these, all these case studies happened in sort of a, a regression framework where there was a suite of control variables and then you control for all of these other factors and what additional influence does the environmental condition have on migration? So that's the way that this work tends to unfold. So this is a graph of their, um, of their main results. So we're gonna see precipitation effects um, as far as the change in precipitation. They also looked at variability. So have trends across time and precipitant, precipitant, <laughs> precipitation and temperature become less predictable. So it's not just a matter of they going up or down, but are they varying more, which turns out to be really important. Um, and they looked at rapid onset disasters. So here are their results. Now this is the standardized environmental effect. So look at the box and whisker plot. And you see the line in the middle is the median effect across this compilation of studies. I highlighted with the red line zero. So that would suggest that there's no environmental effect. You can see that all of the effects are positive, right? They're on the right-hand side of the line, suggesting the environmental insult, if you will, always had a positive effect, not always, because there is some over on the other side, but consistently was more likely to have a positive effect than not on the likelihood of migration. So to me, I think this is just a powerful study because it integrates so much, so many of the case studies that, that we have all done. So I wanna just cover two different pieces of the demographic literature that really demonstrate complexity, right? Which is the theme for today's work, complexity in a changing world. So the changing world I'm focusing on is related to our climate context. And, the demographic literature has really shown complexity within that that calls into question this very simplistic notion of climate refugees. So one is that those environmental influences intertwine with all the economic, cultural, and other factors to shape migration. And this has been shown in all sorts of different places across the globe. So one of the things about those earlier forecasts for climate refugees was that you know, imagine modeling sea level rise, right? And all of these individuals, all of these households are exposed to sea level rise. Those forecasts assume they were all gonna be displaced. Well, that's far too simplistic because as our keynote speaker said, right? There are different ways of adaptation um, and, and different kinds of factors that shape resilience. So it's just not so simple. 
And another point is that in rural households, so if we're thinking about that livelihood migration often from rural to urban areas, migration is only one among different adaptation strategies that households have at their disposal. So uh, research has shown, for example, that remittances can be used to you know, buy drought resistant seeds to think about developing um, infrastructure in support of agriculture in the context of climate pressures, something as simple as water storage, for example. So there are ways that households can adapt other than migration. So when does, okay, thank you. When does that migration become forced? So this was a piece by Robert McClemon. We can think of it in this way, right? So imagine households have an existing livelihood strategy. So, and the severity of climate hazard is on the, on the Y axis. So things are going pretty well, right? No additional adaptation needed, maybe some climate hazards and ultimately that current strategy no longer works. So you try something different. It works for a while, then maybe not so much, then maybe not so much, and then migration, right? What we don't know is what is the threshold at which that migration becomes forced? One way that this has been done, although there's been very little work on thresholds, I want to highlight Narotsky's, is looking, thinking about modeling migration as an outcome. And you don't look at the effect of maybe um, uh, temperature or precipitation change the year prior to the would-be migration, but it accumulates over time. And Narotsky's work showed us that it took three years of drought before households were more likely to send a migrant. This is from Mexico to the US in this particular case. And that's the kind of work that we might need in order to understand those tipping points as related to thresholds. Just quickly, um, our remaining puzzles, I think the idea of what is voluntary versus involuntary migration, and at what point does a, is a tripping point reached where um, that migration might be forced, and I really appreciate that speakers have already brought up the idea of immobility because um, I won't go through this because of time. We can have involuntary mobility, right? Which is displacement. We can also have involuntary immobility, which I think is really important in the context of climate in particular and that populations might be trapped. Some ways to move forward. I love meta-analyses. I'm a junkie for them, especially once we've got this body of research that can really tell us something if we pull it together. I think we need to grapple with measurements of how do we measure thresholds and those tipping points. And there are all sorts of new, um, not new, agent-based modeling has been around for a while, but it's being applied to climate related, climate related migration. And I love qualitative work that's showing up too, because it's talking to the would-be migrants or the migrants themselves to better understand how climate intersected with these other pieces of their worlds in order to bring forth migration. I think that's a very important perspective. So I will leave us there and hope a big lesson here is be careful, right? When we categorize broad swaths of people as related to climate migration, because that movement is so complex um, that we really wanna unpack that terminology and think about definition and of course, how important is the definition um, in the context of policy, which I appreciated the response from our, from our keynote speaker. So thank you very much. I really look forward to talking with you all. Thank you so much, Lori. I, uh... I'm not as enamored of meta-analyses as you are because I, I think I don't read the as good of ones as you do. I, I need to read that one. It looks fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, send me those. Uh, I'm going to send it over to uh, Elizabeth Ferris now. She's going to talk now. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Is that loud enough? Please just wave if it is, and I understand people online have had trouble hearing. So um, anyway, I'm delighted to be here and to add a different perspective as we look at some of the current trends, a global overview of displacement. 
You know, usually when we think of, you know, what is happening in the world, we think of the most recent crisis. Right now, I suspect that many of us in this room are really thinking about what's happening in the Middle East right now, given the, you know, the levels of violence and also the unprecedented levels of displacement. You know, OCHA tells us one and a half million Palestinians have been displaced so far in Gaza. These are people who have a long history of displacement. In Israel, there are unprecedented unprecedented numbers of internally displaced since 1948 with tens of thousands, over 100,000 people who've been displaced. And we know that in Lebanon there are people who are displaced as a result of the conflict with Hezbollah. Again, these are layers of displacement, people who've been displaced over time. So when we look at these figures of how many displaced in the world, I think it's really important to unpack those who have been displaced displaced for years. So I'm going to talk briefly about protracted displacements, what I call here the, sorry, is the PowerPoint up? Oh, there it is. Okay. Protracted displacement. You know, we, we've seen everybody knows there are these steadily rising numbers of refugees, and especially IDPs. You look at those figures, and it's, the number of IDPs is growing much faster than the number of refugees, possibly as a result of hardening borders. People simply can't escape from Syria, say, to Turkey the way they could a few years ago. We know that displacement is lasting longer, but, you know, frankly, our tools are pretty bad. You hear different references to the average length of displacement. 20 years, 26 years, World Bank says 12 years, using different methodologies. But nothing new has been developed to really accurately track how long have individuals been displaced, not how long has a particular situation existed. Anyway, so that's one, one challenge for us to think about how to measure protracted displacement. UNHCR uses a different measure for um, protracted refugee situations with a numerical limit of 25,000. The accepted measure for protracted internal displacement doesn't talk about an inter a, a number, a numerical um, limitation on how many people have been displaced for X number of years, but rather about frozen situations where possibilities for solutions seem difficult. I think we have to recognize that our traditional solutions simply are not working. Less than 10% of the world's refugees have been, have found a solution every year for decades, even as the number increases. So the issue of solutions is, is something, I don't know about you, but I often just kind of throw off in my class as well, the three traditional solutions are one, two, three, and for IDPs, one, two, three. But when you really start unpacking them and you start thinking about the difference difficulties, you know, voluntary repatriation of refugees. Remember back in the 90s when we saw hundreds of thousands of people joyfully returning? Those days are over. You know, maybe a trickle of people going back to places like Syria. Is it sustainable? We don't really know. Um, what about local integration? You know, I did some work on the Global Compact on Refugees and hosting countries were in competition with each other, trashing the notion of integration. We could not use the term integration in a lot of the debates over solutions. Jordan and Lebanon said, nope, 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 these folks are here just temporarily. You know, local integration is becoming more difficult even for refugees and IDPs who have lived in a community for years. R raising the question of what does integration mean? Is it just numerical measures of your income? Or does it also reflect a sense of belonging, acceptance, home, as you mentioned? And resettlement numbers finally starting to pick up in the world as a result of changes in US policy, but never more than a trickle or a a drop of, of meeting the needs of those who are displaced. So I want just to go over some of the, I say, recent initiatives trying to come up with other solutions. 
Complementary protection been used by UNHCR for a long time, subsidiary protection. I think you see renewed momentum, though, around complementary protection these days. That's in terms of evacuations for medical reasons, increasingly using educational pathways, having refugees have the opportunity to study elsewhere, some exciting things happening around labor mobility for refugees. Um, not going through traditional resettlement channels, but finding, being able to start a new life elsewhere through other means. I think there are some very promising things happening there. Um, the private sponsorship of resettled refugees with Canada having done this for years, U.S. now beginning, kind of a slow start, but a beginning with Welcome Corps, really trying to engage communities much more. Um, and really tap into that sense of what does it mean to belong, to feel accepted, and through that community um, response, trying to increase that. Um, for IDPs, uh, internally displaced people, ever since the high-level panel on internal displacement a few years ago, there's been a new action agenda on internal displacement. And key to that, this is Robert Piper's office in Geneva. And I must say, I think he has catalyzed the IDP community in ways I haven't seen in maybe in 20 years. You know, everybody is talking about solutions for IDPs. What kind of solutions can we find? Can we pilot? Can we measure? Can we, can we try? So a lot is happening on the, for, the, for IDP solutions. And I'll come back to a couple of those in a, in a minute. We know that mobility, even outside of our formal frameworks, is often a solution for refugees and IDPs. Megan Bradley at McGill did a study on Central America and talked about the impact of SEREFCA. Do you remember that was this multi-agency support for solutions for displaced people in Central America in the 80s and the 90s? SEREFCA is generally seen as a rousing success where you know, agencies like UNDP and UNHCR actually work together to support solutions for refugees and IDPs. But what she found was that, yeah, most of the refugees found solutions on their own. They found their own mobility pathways, many to the U.S. and Canada, quite apart from all of these institutional endeavors. Um, Alex Alenikoff has argued elsewhere that the best solution for refugees is to give them travel documents. Let them go where they will, and they will find jobs and places that will accept them if they had the freedom to choose. Um, Self-reliance is getting a lot of attention these days. Sometimes it's kind of a de facto integration. Well, it's not going to be full integration, but at least you can support yourself. And some uh, Refuge Point, Women's Refugee Commission, there's a whole community of practice around refugee self-reliance, which is a good thing for refugees to be independent. It's a good thing for host communities to see refugees independent and earning their own livelihoods. And, and it's a good thing for donors possibly decreasing the demand for humanitarian assistance if refugees can support themselves. Some are wondering if this is, in fact, de facto integration. Maybe we ought to change our terminology and add self-reliance as a fourth, not quite a full traditional solution, but maybe on the way. I'm impressed with the activities of refugee-led organizations and the possibilities for more co-research with refugee-led organizations and academic research around this question of solutions. I mean, we'll hear later from the mayor's office in New York. In D.C., where we faced a similar issue, most of the migrants who are coming are finding their way through other immigrants, not through a lot of the outreach efforts of the D.C. government. Is there any way to tap into that as we look at solutions and instead of sitting in our ivory towers and thinking of solutions? And UNH, UNHCR in Mexico and Brazil, in cooperation with those governments, has done some pretty creative things in moving refugees from areas where there are no jobs and conditions are lousy to parts of the country where there is a dramatic need for entry-level labor. 
leading to integration, self-reliance, to some sense of home, belonging. Uh, we did research in, in Mexico, in Monterrey, and Saltillo, and found that many of the people relocated said, we're replacing, we've given up on the American dream, el sueño americano, but now we have el sueño mexicano. Uh, at the same time, some 30% of participants in the program leave to make their own way illegally across the U.S. border. So there, there are questions about that. And finally, a new initiative that IOM and Georgetown is working on called Progress, saying, look, you know, measuring an end to displacement is difficult. For IDPs, at least, can we begin to measure progress towards solutions, halfway steps, interim steps, not yet full solutions, maybe those will never happen, but some indication of increasing the well-being, the safety, the protection of IDPs. I'm using a number of data sets. And I was delighted, Ellen, to hear you talk about IRIS, you know, which has come up with a, with a standard for measuring the and solutions for displacement. When the gap between the national population and IDPs narrows or disappears, then you can say there's been a solution. So, you know, the assumption that displacement is temporary, we know isn't true. We know that displacement increases poverty. We know that humanitarian agencies, sorry, UNHCR, are not well placed to deal with displacement after 10, 20, 25 years. That we need the expertise of those who focus on sustaining initiatives and in empowering communities and working with local actors. I think there's a question of who benefits from protracted displacement. I mean, is it in anybody's interest, to institutional interest, government interest? I mean, we know that in some cases, displacement has been used as a political tool, a bargaining chip. I'm thinking of places like Georgia or Azerbaijan before this latest um, uh, military action. And finally, the, you know, these, this is not a new issue, even talking about protracted displacement for solutions. But where is the academic community? You know, Donna and I edited this special issue last year on protracted displacement. I think it was quite good, but you know, it's much sexier to write about the latest displacement challenge than to really dig into, you know, where are the solutions for protracted displacement in DRC? Where are the academic articles saying this is what could or should happen? I mean, I see the role of the academic community is providing evidence for policymakers and activists to bring about change. You know, I think we have the potential of offering guidance on solutions to displacement, work more with displaced people themselves, a crying need for longitudinal research to look at the same displacement situations or the same displaced people over time. And I'm sorry, I'm running out of time, but just to say we know almost nothing about protracted disaster displacement. The assumption is it's temporary, everybody goes home after the floodwaters subside. But I suspect the reality is very different. The Internal Displacement Monitoring Center did a study three or four years ago, and they found, I think, 12,000 people displaced, still displaced by Superstorm Hurricane Sandy. Years after the fact, and people still displaced after Hurricane Katrina. You know, there are questions maybe about methodology, but, you know, when we're looking at disaster or climate displacement, let's not forget that this may not be a temporary phenomena and may last for a long time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Beth. I think that this, uh, we should really re uh, remember that uh, protracted displacement is the majority of people in the world. And um, we don't always focus on that. So I think that's an important reminder. Um, uh, now I'm going to turn to Dr. Veronica Finbrui, who is uh, joining us from online. Sorry, I'm trying to multitask here. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Kevin and Holly and CMS and Professor Susan Martin for thinking of me to be a part of this panel. I'm speaking to you from Calgary, 
which is uh, Treaty 7 of the Aboriginal Indigenous Peoples of Canada, who were displaced hundreds of years ago by settler colonists that came to this country from England and France. And these Aboriginal people still struggle today for belonging, for justice, as they're still living on reserve in Canada, in Alberta. And um, there seemed to be no kind of 1951 convention to protect their forced displacement. Um, I also want to speak to you about my own lived experience as a survivor of war. And speaking of who and where and how of displacement, um, I'm hoping by the end of my presentation, I can you can leave this session with some humanity or humanitarian reason to care, especially for women and children who bear the most brunt of war and violence. I'm I'm coming to speak to you today not as anyone else, but as a war survivor. And these are the moments that I cherish the most because I don't know if I hadn't been a refugee or an internet displaced person or a global migrant, I will have the level of education that I have today, six university degrees, and be sitting with uh, the amazing peer uh, and uh, uh, panelists. But there's something to be said about war survivors and especially women and children, because I was a child when they, I was a young child, a teenager, a young teenager, when the war started in Liberia. And so um, my goal is to always bring that humanly, humanly or humanitarian or uh, lived experience to these kind of situations. I love to speak as an academic, but my lived experience is what I value most. Um, I want to start off by giving you a little bit of a background since we're talking about who, where, and, and how. It was in 1816 when the American Colonization Society decided that it didn't want Black people anymore in America that has been or that have been emancipated, they should find somewhere, even though they didn't know where they were taken from, from Africa, they should find somewhere in Africa to send them. And while I respect these uh, uh, abolitionists, I think the crux of the situation was slavery was abolished and there needed to be somewhere to put these people that had lesser human lives than live with them and share human rights and dignity with them. And so Francis Scott Key, Robert Finley, Bush of Washington, nephew of George Washington, I mean, these highly statesmen, men sat in Washington, D.C., in David's Hotel and decided on the Back to Africa movement. And that's what that was the birth of Liberia. Sadly, many Americans don't know this history and many African-Americans don't know they have relatives um, in Liberia because of um, 1816 and, and, and the movement, the, Afro, the Back to Africa movement. So from 1820 to 1906, nearly 15,000 African American or Black people were returned to Liberia to form what we have now as the Republic of Liberia. This is the birth of Liberia's war. And I know a lot of people like to say people, you know, Africans and poor people like to blame America for everything. This is my history. This is my ancestors' history, and for me, this is crucial. If we are to deal with the root causes of displacement, then we need to really 
learn as a society not to repeat history. The movement back to Africa created a lot of internal conflict in Liberia. I know America technically is not a colonizer, but to Liberians and to me, I think Liberia is America's only colony because Congress did provide $100,000 for the Back to Africa movement. And ever since, I've been very much in the center and the front of Liberia's political, social, economic, and basic existence. This conflict between the indigenous Liberians that were there and the free slaves that returned to the continent continued for over 132 years and fooled and culminated into what happened in 1989 when I was a young teenager, just turned a teenager. There's so many painful experiences of Liberia civil war. And as I listen to my, pan, my fellow panelists speak, I'm holding back tears because it's been more than 30 years since the war in Liberia, but trauma from war never goes away. And this is the passion and the lived experience that I bring to my academic work. And nothing will dissociate me from this lived experience to inform how I advocate, how I research, how I engage, how I show empathy, how I show resilience, how I fight, and how I make sure that women and children do not continue to suffer because it is a lifetime, very, very painful experience that a lot of people don't know about. Write about it academically, research about it academically, but you will never know this experience until you actually live it. I'm not going to go into details to tell you of all the violence that I faced uh, in during three years of being internally displaced in Liberia and nine, almost 10 years of being uh, a refugee in Ghana. And then of course, ending up in Canada with 20 US dollars and two suitcases as a refugee sponsor student. And from then just became a legal, literally a global migrant. I'm not going to tell you the details because 12 minutes is not enough, but I would leave you with one experience during the war in Liberia. This was 1990. So the war started on 24th of December, 1989. I still remember, I have vivid memory of how the rebels enter Liberia and we were all like, what? what is Christmas Eve and we are starting a war? I mean, we never thought about it as a war. It was just a conflict happening up north. But we were displaced uh, in July when we attacked for the first time. And me and my family, basically my mom and my seven siblings, I grew up with a single mother, so my father was never in my life. Uh, we were displaced to Firestone of all places. Firestone is responsible for all your rubber tires that you drive around <laughs> in this part of the world. So we're displaced to Firestone Rubber Plantation. And, you know, as war happens, you get attacked. Whoever is living in our community get forcibly displaced. And then there are empty houses. So when we went to Dusa, uh, uh, Division Number 6, at a time, nobody were in most of the houses that we had gone. But what was spe uh, peculiar to that division of Firestone Rubber Plantation, it had the major hospital. Of course, it was Firestone was owned by the Firestone Brothers from New York. Um, it was American. The hospital was great. It has everything for all the top level uh, Firestone Plantation workers. So the hospital was well equipped and had really good doctors, even in the middle of the war. So it ended up being a space where the rebel, Charles Stato rebels were actually using that because he had attacked and owned that area at the time. Then we became attacked the second time by Prince Johnson, one of the other rebel fashion. And so that was our second displacement. I remember we were attacked for 
over 24 hours. So usually we were told to just lie on our tummy and while the measles and the guns and, and straight bullets kill a, a lot of people. In fact, kill a little boy. I think he was seven years old that day. And we were hearing a welling, but nobody can go outside. So we basically lie on our tummy until they've, they've, uh, there was some kind of ceasefire. And then we heard knocks on the door. So these rebels are asking everybody to come out and we're afraid. There was a young man in our, our little floor, our, our apartment, our house, we're staying, we're all lying on the floor. There was no bed or anything. We lie on the floor for nine months. Um, and he was very afraid because he thought at that time they were recruiting uh, young boys to to go and join the rebels. So And he didn't want to join. So, so he was afraid and then, we heard somebody saying, if you don't open this door, we are going to blow up this house. And I was like, I think they're telling everybody to go outside. So we all ran outside. When we went, everybody in the village, Dusa, uh, uh division number six, everybody was were lined up in front of their houses. We were the last one, but we were afraid. Anyways, they told us all to single file. And we single file head us straight to the hospital. We went to the hospital. And by the time we got there, we're told we're supposed to go into the hospital. The hospital is filled, filled with sick people. There is no space, but we're told to go into the hospital because this is part of the strategy of the fighters, mostly men. Men, you barely saw women doing it. My time is up, so I'm all I'm, I'm ready to summarize. It's mostly men. Their strategy is if we use civilians as our shield, then we won't get attacked. So we were told to go to the hospital so that we can be used as buffer between these people that are fighting each other. And so finally, um, Charles Still a rebel came back to reclaim while we're in transition to go to the hospital. We lie on our, on our, we were told to drop down and lie flat on our tummy, right in front of the hospital. Me and my siblings, we are now between the ages of two years old and 19, my eight siblings. My eldest brother was 19 years old at the time. And these people just fought and killed each other while we are lying there, crying. People are afraid for their lives. My poor mother, who had tuberculosis, who could barely walk. I had to be the breadwinner for our family because my mom is so frail. Thanks to Medicine Sun Frontier, who saved her life afterwards. But that was one of the incidents that I remember so vividly because talking about geography, we were not part of the international media. We never made news. But thanks to Elizabeth Blunt, I still remember that woman in the middle of, of the war. She was the only white reporter who risked her life for Liberia. And I remember lying on the floor in front of Dusa Hospital in Firestone and Elizabeth Blunt is yanked away because there were measles flying over us. And this woman, of course, she's an international journalist and they're trying to save her life. And it just yanked her and put her in the back of the pickup and it drove her away. And these are the lived experiences of survivors of war. This is just one example of the three years I endure in Liberia and the 10 years I endure in Ghana and the ongoing life, painful experiences of trauma that is triggered by what I see in Gaza. 
that brings tears to my eyes every day for women and children. Not to end on a sad note, I'm glad to say I'm a president of the International Association for the Study of Forced Migration. We bring together academics and practitioners to work with hard evidence, as Elizabeth pointed out, so we can bring lasting solution. You know, Elizabeth's words are so powerful. Who benefits from protracted displacement? I know. So I invite you to visit our website. We have our annual meetings. Our next meeting is coming up in January 2025, um, and it will be in Indonesia. So I invite you to attend, to become a part of ISFM so we can help contribute to bring in lasting solutions to displacement. Thank you. right? Um, they are also mo mainly women and children, as we know. Um, I think uh, the other thing that Veronica's story reminded me also was um, of uh, coming back to Ellen's presentation is uh, the selectivity and comparison, right? Um, Veronica went through trauma. She lived through war. She lived through multiple displacements. She was protractedly displaced. And um, she is also uh, a lucky person in many ways, right? Because she has come uh, to uh, reside in a third country. She does have a durable solution, um, unlike most of uh, the forcibly displaced around the world. So on that note, I'm gonna open it up to um, uh, audience and uh, both online and here in the room for questions um, and comments. Um, please, we welcome that, and then we'll turn to the panelists so they can um, re respond and, uh, and share um, as well. Any questions or comments from anyone on any of the presentations we have? Usually silent group here, yes. Uh, my name is Estela Rivero, and I'm fr um, coming from the University of Notre Dame. And um, my question is um, trying to tie uh, on the or drawing from the selectivity and, um, and the stories we heard today uh, and also on the first presentation. So as we claim to, for the right not to be displaced, it actually uh, makes me think what that means and what uh, I want to ask uh, whether we know anything about the consequences or what do we know about the consequences of being left behind? and that selectivity. Um, and if not, what we need to do to uh, better know that. Thank you. Um, other questions or comments? We'll take a few, collect some, and then we can uh, come back to the panelists. All right, well, if there's no more at the moment, we'll I'll turn over to um, that's a great question, and I think each of the four of us might want to address that because that's that's a big picture question, um, and uh, I think 
Alex and Laurie are so right that our uh, engagement of perspectives on climate change and environmental change puts into relief the resources available to, for people to leave and, and not to leave. I'm going to take it to a very forensic and uh, place that is not terribly satisfying. But research design is really important. Research design takes us to the comparisons that we want to make. Um, I had a moment a few years ago in a deep dive around um, a proposal that our panel, a different panel for ISSP, wanted to pursue and will continue to pursue a world migration survey. We did it for fertility. We do it for health. Why not for migration to really generate comparable data on the dynamics of migration? But in working with some colleagues in different organizations, I was asked, we, we were talking about research design and how to think about implementing. And I, you know, my head went to the moment, the place of census data and a nationally, rep, nationally representative surveys. And I was confronted with the question about why would we want to study non-migrants? Well, without an appreciation of these tools and research design and really the, the importance of variation, um, not that we want variation, we want everyone to have right standards of living and, and well-being and health, but um, to understand where the, some of the issues are, we really have to think more broadly about how we're organizing our questions and how we're addressing them at different scales. You know, the scale to which Veronica took us is absolutely as valid and reliable and accurate as any other scale. We just need to, I think one of our analytic challenges is to work across scales to integrate the qualitative research with the quantitative research in a way that tells the right story and informs um, effectively based policy intervention and prevention. So I, I'm not... I didn't answer your question, but I, you take us to an incredibly important place. And I think Veronica and Lori and Beth will chime in as well. But thank you. Yeah, I think when you look at the question of what happens to those left behind, there's a real variety. I mean, in a lot of families, it's a tried and true livelihood strategy to send one member of the family to the city to work for a few months and come back. And, you know, we know from some of the disaster response mechanisms that, you know, a sign of increasing distress is when whole families begin to move instead of the traditional, usually send a male breadwinner to, to the city. So I think it varies. I think also the role of remittances is really important to help people survive back home, maybe to help them prepare for a climate, although I, I don't think the research is very good on that yet. But could, could those remittances also be used to find solutions for people who've been displaced in their own countries for years and years? So I think we could do a lot more with that. Lori or Veronica, would you like to comment. Please go ahead, Veronica. Really important question. In my uh, case, so um, me and my family left Liberia in uh, 19, 1997, no, 1992. And it was me and my mom and my siblings on a deck of a peacekeeping vessel. We went to Ghana, but life was so hard in Ghana as refugees. So my mom left and went back to Liberia with my siblings, and I stayed in Ghana. So I think that was the turning moment for my life because the war wasn't over, but mama was just, she just, she'd rather just go home to die than live in Ghana as a refugee because life was really hard. And so that was my changing moment uh, in terms of now I had opportunity to go to school at a lot of disadvantage because I was exposed to all kinds of violence once my mom was had left and I had to stay in Ghana by myself as a young child. Um, but I, I managed to go to school 
and then got my first university degree from the University of Ghana, which opened that door for me to get the so-called durable solution, which is the resettlement to a safe third country, Canada. And that's how I came to Canada on a refugee-sponsored program. And so now the only one who had left, who is so educated relatively, and then, uh, then my sister got married to a Liberian who was also resettled in the U.S. So then my sister and I decided, talking about it, just exactly what your question goes to, who left behind, who is left behind, what happens and the consequences. My sister and I come over and we are relatively young. We've lost at least five years of our lives to war and, and no education and anything. But we had to struggle as young, two young women uh, putting our lives on hold to literally look after the rest of our family. As uh, Beth, sa Beth said, with remittances, I'm not sure what a remittances really does a lot because I still have those Western Union stock up that um, my sister and I send back money for so many years. I mean, I'm a full-time student at the University of British Columbia and I'm working 60 hours a uh, a week to look after my family. And so our strategy was exactly as you said, Beth, was to send for the rest of the family. And because of Liberia and, like, and the U.S. relationship, my entire family immigrated to the U.S. They now live in the U.S. I'm the only one who lives in Canada. And, uh, and that was what actually helped a lot, but it took nearly five years of working as two young ladies, my sister and I, she's younger than me, sacrificing our lives while going to school to be able to save up enough money to uh, send for the entire family. And so that helped because when everybody comes now, um, we didn't need to send back money anymore. And so then uh, that made it a lot e easier financially, but I still have my cousins and, my family members who live in Ghana through protractors situation for 33 years now are still living on a resettlement. It's no longer a refugee camp. And the consequences is enormous. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. A, I can add a couple of things um, if we still have time. Oh, please go ahead, Lori. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, so the idea of migrant selectivity is where it began, right? So I, I, even though I've been doing this forever, it always blows my mind when I see patterns in the data, right? But the idea of migrant health selectivity is well documented, right? That the healthier individuals on a household are, are the most likely to, to move and then negative health selectivity on the way back, likely to come back once that health declines. And there is some work on remittances that's now showing the use of remittances for um, climate adaptation. You're right, Beth, it's just emerging and there's a lot more we need to do in there, but um, evidence of, as I mentioned, sort of um, uh, different kinds of drought resistant seeds or investments in agricultural infrastructure or households can try things like just changing the planting timing and different kinds of adaptations like that. But I wanted to mention um, what two, two other quick things. The link between migration, health and climate climate explored empirically. And part of that is related to data, as you, as you talked about, Ellen, um, uh, to get good data on migration, good data on health, and the geocodes that allow you to attach climate, that's really hard to find. I have two proposals under review right now, so stay tuned. I hope to do some of that work sometime soon. And the last thing is that remember that not all not non-migrants are involuntary. There's a lot of work that suggests that many people who don't move just don't want to move, right? And so we don't want to assume that all households that haven't moved are trapped. So there's also voluntary, I, I didn't get to that four by four matrix very much, but there are also voluntary non-migrants. So thinking about that distinction, I think is important too, but thanks for the question. 
Thank you. Yeah, I think I think actually we know quite a lot about stairs in theory um, because you know they should be in left in the country, right? Um, in the data that are collected, right? But we know that many of places that have suffered war are of very poor data, right? Um, and um, sometimes haven't had a census in decades, right? So um, you know, and then to get at the the health issue as well is really complex, as Lori mentioned. So. Uh, other questions, comments from the audience? You're Holly, a very quiet group today. Holly, uh, we have a question from Susan Martin in the chat. Great. Um, so she says uh, that Beth talked about the importance of refugee-led organizations. Uh, so could you just address how we can bring refugees and displaced persons into decision-making on issues that affect their lives? Yeah, I mean, some really good things are happening with the growth of refugee-led organizations, networks of refugee-led organizations that are demanding a seat at the table. I mean, you see this with the UNHCR and plans for the Global Refugee Forum, where for the first time ever, there will be a robust participation of these organizations there. I mean, I think we need to look at this at, at other levels, at the national level. You know, how are refugees involved in decisions made by the Office of Refugee Resettlement, for example? or state refugee coordinators or you know it's, it's difficult sometimes to include refugees in these forums because they're so busy you know they're working jobs and don't have a lot of extra time to go to meetings um, but I think we really need to experiment and see if there are ways to give them a more effective voice it's it's really you know the whole issue of accountability to affected populations is one very concrete way that this can be manifest it's not it can be surprisingly beneficial, I think, to bureaucrats to hear some of the suggestions coming from the communities that they hadn't considered. So I think it's really a, a positive sign in this very depressing landscape we're living in is to see the emergence of the, these organizations and the support they're receiving. Can I just add to that? Uh, all of us are involved in civil society here in, in North America. Look at who's on boards. You're involved with organizations. Always pull that up. Who is on boards? Um, the boards, I've, I think, if people are asked, they will either say yes or no. But uh, look at the composition of boards in which to which you contribute, and to which uh, for organizations in which you are involved. Thank you. Another question from the audience here. Um, I was recently, another thing that is in the works is I was recently at an event at Google that um, Justicia Labs organized. And basically the idea is to create an online platform so that refugees and migrants can get access to information so that they can become self-reliant and also create communities so that people can learn from each other's experiences. I think it's a really exciting partnership between Justicia Labs and Google to think about ways to use technology to help communities that want to become self-reliant, to help them network, and to help them have access to information when the system is not working for them. We need to give them the information so that they, they can make it work for themselves. Thank you for that comment. Question over here? from. Good morning, thank you so much. Uh, I'm Marciana Popescu, I'm a professor at Fordham University, and I also have the privilege of directing this amazing community-driven project called Her Migrant Hub. So I have a comment and a question. The comment is we do need the voices of people with lived experiences of forced migration beyond just the consultative role that they have, right? How do we engage them in research uh, meaningfully? And that, that implies a change in paradigm. You know, they are the real experts that can teach us what are the challenges that they are facing. And I think that's vital for changing the way in which we develop policies and programs. The question is about, uh, you know, like you refer that the current solutions that do not work. And I'm in total agreement, they do not work. But how do we get to the root cause? Uh, you know, like they do not 
not work because the refugee convention might be too narrow? Can we go back to Cartagena, you know, looking at the, conven the Car Car Cartagena Convention? Should we use the Global Compact? How do we get to the root causes to understand what are the gaps and not throw the current solutions altogether, but try to maximize protections that we have while thinking of other paths? Okay, because of time, I think that will be the last question. So I'm going to turn to Beth. I mean, you're absolutely right. The biggest failure is our failure to address the causes. And, you know, our international community has done a lousy job at preventing conflicts or preventing resolving conflicts. You know, that's really the, the problem and one of the reasons why these solutions are so difficult um, and also the cause of so much suffering. I think it's just overwhelming to people who are working, say, with people with displacement experience to have to tra tackle all of that as well. But we need to hold our international institutions. I mean, look at the UN Security Council. It's just totally stalemated, blocked for taking action on anything. You know, the role of peacekeepers, that was supposed to be you know, kind of a solution for some of these conflicts. And it's, the record is definitely mixed on that. So you know, when you go back to Alex's discussion of avert, minimize, address, well, I think we fail on averting displacement. We pretty much fail on minimizing displacement. And so the <laughs> focus seems to be on, well, what can we do? We can't address the causes, so let's deal with what we have. But, but that is undoubtedly the biggest failure of our world. Wonderful question, and I would take us back to the seminal work of Barry Zolberg, who in the 1980s said, no, disruption, displacement is not stochastic. It, it derives from social, economic, environmental change. Poverty has a lot to do with it, but I do think we need partnerships to work across these domains of knowledge so we can integrate them to lead us to just solutions for prevention and also and response. But we need to take the um, rose-colored glasses off and really look at root causes in a way that connects to other sorts of, of uh, problems as well. Climate change, poverty, health differentials, displacement. Thank you. Lori, do you have a comment? Let Veronica go first and, I, and then okay. I will see Okay, Veronica, head. please. It's it's honestly it's really refreshing to listen to Beth and and uh, Ellen iterate and reiterate how or affirm how the need to uh, go back to root causes is so important. And for me, as someone someone with a lived experience, this is all I've advocated my whole life. But I think the reality is, um, you know, as Ross Coggan said in a development set. It's good for us to sit around in Geneva and New York around big meals and with mouthful talk about, you know, um, development and all the big words we can think about because that's what fuel our very existence. Um, we all know that the 1951 Refugee Convention was is limited. It was created and drafted based on a very small minority and group of people in however way we wanted to read into the law and extend it to other places. I think Cartagena and of course the African Refugee Convention are two seminal, so to speak, uh, documents that we can also go back to in terms of reforming and reviewing and, and reframing the 1951 Refugee Convention. It, I just, as a simple woman, uh, survivor of war, I just always find it very interesting how these laws come into place, uh, made by certain people with power from certain places, but the same people have that power to change it and would just refuse to do it. Just simply refuse to do it because if it's not there, then they can get the trips to the war zones and get all the concessions to get paid whatever money they get paid to do the work that they do. When people with lived experience, nobody pays me to go back to Liberia to go and do the work that I do. That's my country, that's where I'm from. I don't need uh, to be paid as, as an expat to go back to Liberia, but that's the whole idea of Ross Coggins' development set. 
if you haven't read it, I really encourage you to read it because it's so powerful. Thank you. But I just want to say, Veronica, you are far from a simple woman. <laughs> and I, um, the only message I want to add to this is that there's a research community out there. I'm part of that that would love to um, do work to help answer these questions about policy. And there's such a gap, I think, between the research and policy community. And I want to know what you need to know. And that's the work that I want to do. So if we could think about bridges, um, that would be amazing. But thank you for this opportunity. I'm jealous. I'm jealous. I'm jealous. I want to eat some of your food. <laughs> we'll get our mouths full. Uh, but just, again, root causes and, and, and solutions and just sort of resonating as a psychologist, say today, you know, 25 years of lawyering and I always each time experience the, the pain, the lived pain of my clients and then find the frustration of how little there is to do on the solution side. You know, the Geneva Convention is the parochial instrument at this point and, and, and many others in the immigration, American immigration system. So I think there's a lot of work to be done, among which is eating lunch, which is now served in the back. Um, but let me just make a note of three things that are going to happen before our next panel begins at 2.10. At 1 o'clock, please join as um, Eva Malona from USCIS will speak about administration priorities and immigrant integration. At 1.15, Lee Gallant from the ACLU will give us a, an update on federal litigation. And uh, if we know Lee at all, maybe he'll even tip us off as to what potentially he might have to do in 2025 if things really, really don't work. Um, and then at 1.30, we'll have uh, Deputy Mayor Ann Williams Isom join us here for about a half hour you know, I don't know exactly, but about 1.30 till about 2 to talk a little bit about her work and the city's work in response to um, the, the arrival of some 130 or more thousand asylum seekers to New York in the last 18 months. So I hope to see you here. If you decide to take a walk, make sure you're back by 1 o'clock. All right. Thank you.